It was just over at the high school yesterday talking to more people than there are here by a factor of 10. And I wonder if they had more knowledge than it's exhibited in this room total. We had a great time to more here. <laughs> anyway, we're pleased to have him today give us a lecture on unequal force of reactional theory. Thank you. So the work that I'll be describing, I, I wrote up in a preprint that appeared approximately November 1st of last year, so four or five months ago. Uh, where did I put the thing? Is I was given a thing for moving. I know I was. There was this clicker I was given. Did I put it down somewhere? Maybe it's in my pocket somewhere. Maybe that's it. Does that do it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, see where where I, I guess suppose I aim it this way. Hmm? Yes. Okay. So the uh, the title uh, that I had on the previous transparency is not completely informative. And a, a more accurate description of what I intend to talk about would be brains in anti de Sitter space and conformal field theories on the Coulomb branch. On the face of it, these topics are not so closely related, but I've been struck by what seems to be a coincidence uh, that the formulas that I get by considering brains in anti de Sitter space have the structure that one might expect for, cool, for, for conformal field theories on the Coulomb branch where the massive fields have been integrated out. And so in special cases where there's lots of supersymmetry and, and one has more control of the, over the theory, I'm sticking my neck out and conjecturing that there's an exact equivalence. This could be completely wrong, and you can judge for yourself how convincing you find my reasoning. Uh, when I gave the opening lecture at the Strings Conference in Munich a couple of years ago, I was talking to people, most of whom, as, as is the case here, are much younger than me, so I thought I would share with them wisdom I've acquired over the years. And one of, the, one of the lessons that I've learned in, in thinking, looking back and asking, had I known this, how, what might I have done? And w w one of the uh, lessons I learned is, is that it's a good idea sometimes to pay attention to things that seem to be coincidences and to explore what would be the consequences of taking those coincidences seriously as a way of formulating conjectures. So that's sort of the spirit in which this work uh, is meant to be taken. So here's my guiding principle. Take coincidences seriously. So to be very specific, what I plan to do is to discuss the world volume actions for certain brains with p spatial dimensions embedded in an anti de Sitter space with p plus 2 dimensions, and to interpret the result, the formula for this P brain action, to interpret it as the effective action for a superconformal field theory uh, on the Coulomb branch. And in certain cases, I'll boldly conjecture that the, this is the exact effective action for this superconformal field theory on the Coulomb branch, capturing an entire non abelian theory on the Coulomb branch. And, I've, and then I introduce the f phrase, in fact, this is the title of the, I used for the uh, manuscript, uh, calling the resulting formula a highly effective action. Because it's not meant to be just correct at low energies, but at all energies. Usually one speaks of low energy effective actions. So, so the brains that I'll study are the st standard ones that have the most supersymmetry. And if the conjecture should turn out to be correct in these cases, then one might get emboldened to make formulate analogous conjectures for examples that have less 
supersymmetry, but I feel the ones that have the most symmetry have the be best chance of being correct. So that's what we start with. So the examples that I consider are, are the standard ones that have lots of supersymmetry. And so from the studies of ADS-CFT, uh, the, the, these are most, for the most part, the standard examples you find in one's paper. Uh, the first one is the ADS-5 times S-5. And as you, as, as I hope most of you know, uh, this geometry arose from considering the near horizon geometry of a D3 brain embedded in 10 dimensions. Uh, then I will make analogous conjectures for uh, cases that don't have, so, so, the, so that has maximal supersymmetry, which means 32 conserved supercharges. Uh, and the next two cases, which, are, which will turn out to be closely related, are, are related to what's known as ABJM theory. And, and, uh, and in these cases, one doesn't have Max, one doesn't have 32 conserved supercharges, but they're three quarters maximal, so they have 24 conserved supercharges. And the last case, uh, which is one that is related again to Juan's original paper, uh, has the full maximal supersymmetry, and it's a six dimensional conformal field theory, which is kind of mysterious and of great interest, and there's been enormous discussion of it in recent times. Uh, this case, uh, as we'll see, uh, it's less clear what the use of the result will be. So the first three ones are. D and M as in D Sure. So, so in, in the uh, in superstring theories, one one has these D brains that uh, Polchinski uh, introduced some time ago, and. Uh, Spatial dimension. That's right. So, so a D, exactly. So a D3 brain has a four-dimensional world volume with uh, three spatial dimensions in one time. An M5 brain has five spatial dimensions. Uh, it means purely spatial. There's no evolution. No, it has five dimensions and one time. So this is a six. So, it's a, so this world volume theory will be six-dimensional. Uh, and M means that it's arising inside M theory. So 11-dimensional M theory has two. Uh, uh, supersymmetric brains, which are the two brain and the five. First, the 10 dimensional string theory and the M11. Uh, That's right. So, more specifically, this is type 2B super string theory and this is type 2A super string theory. And these two are arising in M theory. So, so we, normally when one thinks about the world volume action of a brain uh, in string theory or M theory embedded. In space-time, uh, the formulas for the action inv involve various approximations. So one thinks that one starts with a specific geometry such as ADS5 times S5 and, puts and imagines inserting the brain in there. And, th and one is making what's the probe re approximation, which means that you're neglecting the back reaction of the brain on the geometry and the other background fields. So, so, the, so these formulas for the brain world volumes actions uh, in, involve that approximation. And since the brain, a single brain carries one unit of brain charge, whatever it is, uh, it's, and it's embedded in a space time that will have, say, n units of flux, where n is an adjustable positive integer, uh, the neglect of the back reaction only is justified if n is very large, so that you don't really care whether n is, you don't care about the distinction between n and n, n plus 1. So that's one of the approx standard approximations in discussing brains. Uh, and, the, and these brain actions, specifically the d-brain actions, in include a term of the Born-Infel type uh, that depends on a U1 gauge field. Uh, F alpha beta being the field strength. And, and, and there are no derivatives of the field strength that appear in the formula. The field strength appears, but not the derivatives. And, and it's generally believed that that's also an approximation uh, that because the, the precise formula, it is presumed, should have arbitrarily high derivatives 
of this uh, field strength. And so to justify ignoring derivatives of the field strength, one has to assume that the fields are slowly varying uh, so that derivatives can be neglected. So those are standard approximations. And uh, so, so the brain actions I'm discussing uh, are just approximate uh, expressions uh, th for the problem that they've been set up to answer, namely what, what is the world volume action of a brain embedded in one of these spacetimes. Now despite these approximations, the formulas for these brains uh, have some beautiful exact properties. So, so for one thing, they realize the symmetries of the background as world volume symmetries. And uh, in, in all of these examples, uh, because the, we're realizing the, the backgrounds have an anti de Sitter factor, and the, uh, so that the, symmetry, the ADS symmetry corresponds, as usual in the ADS CFT story, to conformal symmetry uh, uh, on the brain. And so, so in these examples, the brains uh, have induced on them the, the symmetry of the background, which is the su superconformal symmetry, which in the case of a D3 brain is a supergroup PSU 2 comma 2 slash 4, or in the, uh, in the cases uh, of the ABGM cases that had 3 quarters maximal supersymmetry, this orthosymplectic 6 slash 4 symmetry. So these superconformal symmetries. So, so despite these approximations, these are exactly realized in these, in these allegedly approximate formulas. Now, in, in the discussion that I'll be describing, just to keep things simple, not only in my presentation, but also in the research that I've done so far, uh, uh, I'm dealing with the bosonic truncations of the formulas and not including the fermionic fields. And so we won't see this full super conformal symmetry, we'll only see the bosonic subalgebras of them being realized. But I believe that it's a straightforward, although technically challenging problem to add the fermionic degrees of freedom and to get the full superconformal symmetry. And that's, that's one of the problems for the future. Now, in addition to realizing the superconformal symmetry, these brain actions also implement duality symmetries of the background theories. So, so in, the, in the case of the D3 brains, uh, they're, these are in a theory that is, they're embedded in, in this ADS5 times S5, which is a solution of type 2B superstring theory. And type 2B superstring theory has an SL2Z uh, duality group. And so this group uh, is also realized as a symmetry of the probe brain action. And in the ABGM examples, the, the background doesn't have a duality group itself, but I had two different realizations uh, of the uh, story, which we'll be discussing later, involving a D2 brain and type 2A string theory and an M2 brain in M theory. And those two formulas, we, as I will describe, are related by an analogous type of duality transformation. So even though these brain actions are approximate formulas for probes, they have these properties as exact properties. And th this is what has intrigued me. Why should something that was formulated as some kind of a approximation have so many beautiful exact properties? And, uh, and they have even some further properties. They have local symmetries. And they have uh, general coordinate invariants. And they have a fermionic local symmetry known as kappa symmetry, uh, which, which uh, is crucial for their consistency. And, but that's something that one will only see when the fermions are included. And since I'm going to be ignoring the fermions in this discussion, we will only see the general coordinate invariance and not the local kappa symmetry. That, that will be, in the, again, in the future after the fermions are added that we'll see that. There turns out that, that uh, because you have these gauge symmetries, that you can do some gauge fixing, and uh, if you wish. And there's a natural gauge choice called a static gauge that results in formulas with a very simple field content. Uh, and this choice uh, 
the, this gauge fixing is interesting because when you make this gauge fixing, uh, the formulas for the transformations of the fields under the global symmetries is, becomes modified. What happens is that the global symmetry transformations would take you out of the gauge, so you have to put, put back a compensating gauge transformation to get the, the correct uh, glo the global transformation in the gauge fixed theory, and I'll say more about that later. Please feel free to interrupt with any questions. Do you use the gauge symmetry? Uh, That's right. Well, if you don't do the gauge fixing, then the local symmetries and the global symmetries work independently. But when you, once you do the gauge fixing, then you don't have the local symmetry anymore, and, and, the, and, the, and the global symmetry transformations become modified. Now, so that's the story about brains in anti de Sitter space. And, and now the proposal is that they have something to do with superconformal field theories on the Coulomb branch. So let me turn to that story. And the basic example that I want to consider is the maximally supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory in four dimensions, which we will, have, which we'll, we'll be relating to the D3 brain formula, because that's a four-dimensional theory with n equal four. And, and actually, to be absolutely precise, I need to choose the gauge group to be U2. So let me explain why I talk about U2 rather than SU2. Usually, usually in, in these theories, where everything is adjoint representation and there are no other multiplets for the maximal supersymmetry, you would say that the U1 decouples and, you can, and it's just SU2 and you don't care about the U1. And that's pretty much true to, for most purposes, but it's not precisely true because there's some subtle topological effects. And their importance uh, has to do with the duality group. Which, and we know that the duality group uh, that, I w that we want is SL2Z, because that's what we have in the type 2B string theory. And so, so if you start with a U2 gauge group, then you do have SL2Z duality. If you were to start with SL SU2, you wouldn't. And this has been discussed recently in work by Aharoni's Cyberg Tachikawa last year, where they explain exactly how, how uh, well, what, what, what duality groups you get for invert in different situations. But if you, if you include the U1 factor, then you do get uh, the SL2Z duality. So that's why I would discuss U2. But for most purposes, this, the, the subtleties of this almost decoupled U1 uh, can be ignored. And so I, so I will write down formulas for SU2 rather than U2. But, uh, we have, but one, strictly speaking, should remember that there is another U1 that does play a role for the duality. So, so therefore, I'll henceforth talk about SU2. So now when we think about the SU2 gauge theory on the Coulomb branch, what that means is that, there, is a, that, we have, that there, are adju there are, the, the field content is, of course, the SU2 gauge fields. And then you have uh, six scalar fields, each of which are also in the adjoint representation. And so if you give a vacuum expectation value, to one of the uh, neutral uh, scalar fields that breaks the, uh, spontaneously breaks the SU2 symmetry and gives mass to the charged uh, gauge fields, which I refer to as the W plus and the W minus. So the charged, so if we think of SU2 as being a photon, a W plus and a W minus. The W plus and W minus multiplets become massive on the Coulomb branch. The photon multiplet remains massless. And, uh, and so the idea of, so that's the Coulomb branch, the standard story for a Coulomb branch. And, uh, and, and so now w once you have that kind of structure, you could in principle integrate out the massive fields by doing a path integral. And produce, which would produce a very complicated formula in terms of the massless photon multi supermultiplet only. So this is sort of a Gedanken calculation because you can't really do it. It's a hopeless path integral, but I mean it's like solving a field theory exactly. It's of that order of complexity, but it, but it should exist. Such a formula should exist. Uh, for, so for, so uh, so you, even though that's something you can't do explicitly. Uh, people have studied it to some orders in various expansions, so, so you know 
various terms that would appear in such a formula, even though you don't have the complete formula. And so what, what I've done is to introduce the phrase highly effective action to refer to this complete formula that we don't have. And uh, so, so, that, so that's just giving it a name. Uh, so I, I don't see any problem with integrating out the massive degrees of freedom exactly in, in principle. Yes? the result going to be non-local at energy scales comparable to the W boson mass? Well, the question of locality, are, you're, so you're, when you say at scales, you mean you're saying how non-local? Um, you have a gradient expansion and you try to sum it up and it's not uniformly convergent around momentum scales around the W boson mass. That's what um, well, the proposal that I'm going to make for this thing is local. So if you're right, then I'm wrong. Uh, but I'd be happy to discuss it with you more. You would. Now, the, I would think you only get one over box plus m squared in the denominator. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, do you call do you call that non-local? Sure. Okay, well I I do have stuff like that I think. Well, I don't know. We can discuss whether I. Have. Okay. So anyway, we can't carry out this exact computation, but we know many properties that this that the result should have. So it should share the symmetries of the original theory, and uh, the original theory are the in the case of this n equal 4 super Yang Mills are the full super conformal group and the full duality group. So, so, what I, so the formulas that I get from these brain actions do have all of those symmetry properties and that's what I will argue is the main evidence for, for the conjecture that the formulas could be identified with this HEA. Is this computation going to be a perturbative power series or is there going to be an answer? Well, I'm going to give an explicit formula uh, for the bosonic part of the answer. Uh, so without any expansion, I'll just write down a formula. And conjecture that it's what you would get from doing this. So the general requirements, as I've said, is that the, that the highly effective action should have all of the unbroken and spontaneously broken global symmetries of the original Coulomb branch theory. So the conformal symmetry is spontaneously broken as a consequence of assigning an expectation value to the uh, massless scalar field that has a flat potential. But, um, but that's just a property of the vacuum. And as far as the, equation, the action or the equations of motion are concerned, you still have the full symmetry. And it should, as I said, it should have the same duality properties as, as the Coulomb branch theory with explicit W fields, which in the case of the D3 brain is the SL2Z. And it should also have the same BPS spectrum. Uh, so, so the N equal 4 super Yang Mills, the W plus and W minus multiplets are BPS. Uh, so th that, which means they saturate the bound uh, on the uh, mass uh, given by the supersymmetry algebra. And, and now, the, now once I have integrated these fields out, they're no longer in my formula. So how can they be there as BPS states? So I, I'm going to argue that they arise as solitons. So you can, be, you can undo the integrating out by, by constructing solitons. That would be the idea. So the claim is that this probe P-brain construction which is an approximate solution to the problem it purports to address, gives a compelling candidate for the exact answer to a different problem. <laughs> Namely, it's a it candidate for the highly effective action for what you get by integrating out the massive fields on the Coulomb branch in the gauge theory. So the two cases that I'll focus on are the n equal 4 super Yang Mills theory in four dimensions with a U2 gauge group 
and the n equals 6, d equals 3 ABGM theory, uh, where, where the gauge group is u2 at level k times u2 at level minus k. So they're, they're churn simons terms in the three-dimensional theory, we, we, and the k's refer to the, their levels. It's good to talk about that here in, at the Simon Center. Uh, so I find it intriguing that we're using, super, using gravitational theories, namely superstring theory or M theory, as tools for studying non-gravitational theories in this work. Uh, because when the, these Coulomb branch theories are just garden variety gauge theories and uh, with, had, don't have anything to do with gravity. But one of the consequences of this is that the formulas that I'll get will have general coordinate invariance, even though they're just matter theories. And I, I think that may be an important lesson. So in a d-dimensional conformal field theory, every term in the action should have dimension d, since there are no scales. On the Coulomb branch, there's a scale, but that's a property of the, of the vacuum and not, not of the action or the equations of motion. And, and so the full conformal symmetry is realized on the action. So indeed, all, the entire action should have dimension d. Now, uh, uh, and, and there are really two di only two distinct options. Either you're not on the Coulomb branch, you're at the base of the Coulomb branch where the gauge symmetry is unbroken, that's not what I'm talking about, or you are on the Coulomb branch. But if you're on the Coulomb branch, the, the, the vacuum expectation about the scalar field is the only scale in the problem, so you could set it equal to one. So you just have two options, zero or one. So there, there are two discrete choices for what the theory is, and it's the second one that I'm dealing with. Now, how, how can you have terms that all having dimension d uh, and still have a very complicated formula for inaction? Well, the, the, the way that works is that there are terms in the action that contain inverse powers of the scalar field. So you can have arbitrarily complicated uh, interactions in, uh, in, in, the, in the formula for your action, and which have dimension much higher than d, but then you bring them back to dimension d just by dividing by the appropriate power of the scalar field. And since the scalar field is going to get a vacuum expectation value, that's a well-defined expression. If you were at the base of the, if you weren't on the Coulomb branch, that would be a singular nonsensical formula to write down. But having uh, scalar fields in the denominators is okay if you know that there's going to be an expectation value. So, so I have to say a little bit about the geometry of anti de Sitter space. So I'm going to be working on the Poincaré patch, and that's an important fact. And so that's what I'm describing here. It's not that uh, in, in my manuscript I discuss what would happen if you considered global description of ADS instead, and that that would lead you to a different construction, which is not relevant for the purposes that I want to explore. So this, this is what's relevant for what I want to do. So, uh, so, I did, so if you s describe uh, uh, anti de Sitter space, uh, let's see, which is the pointer? Yeah, whoops, what did I do? I pushed some funny button. Okay. So there's a laser. Oh, here's the laser. This is it. Okay. So, so, so in the a so ADS5 times S5, uh, oh, I, oh, I see, I advanced the slide. That's what messed me up. Okay, so we, we consider this hyperboloid in, uh, in, 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 in as a, so we embed p plus two dimensional space in p plus three dimensions by this equation, and that, that describes uh, anti de Sitter space, and so the, uh, and that manifestly uh, has the SO, uh, uh, Okay, well, right, so why, why is this Lorentzian product, and you have u and v, so this manifestly has the uh, symmetry of uh, SO p comma 2, or something like that, SO p plus 1 comma 2. So the, so the, in, the, the metric that's uh, invariant uh, under, the, under that group is just this. And, and then it's convenient to make a change of variables. So you define x this way, 
and then eliminate u this way, and then the metric takes this form, which is one of the standard ways of writing the metric of anti de Sitter space in the Poincare patch. OK. So, but we want ADS5 times S5. And the, uh, the S5, give me, so this is the metric of a unit 5 sphere. And, uh, and, and both the ADS and the 5 sphere have the same radius r. So this is the 10 dimensional metric that we're dealing with in the case of ADS5 times S5. And, and you can recast this way by replacing V by a six dimensional vector, VI. Uh, uh, that, that combines the sphere with this term. So that's what's written here. So in this formula, the V is the length of the six vector, VI. And la later, I'll find it convenient to allow myself to change the normalization of V. So I'll introduce a, a six vector phi. Uh, where, where C is a constant that we can adjust if we want to. So phi will be identified with the six scalar fields that we have in the theory. And, uh, and to give them an, a, a convenient normalization, I allow myself an arbitrary constant. Now, fr from the standard ADS-CFT duality, one knows the relationship between this radius r and the string coupling constant, the number of units of flux, and the string length scale, which, which is given this. So that's in Juan's original famous paper. And then, the, uh, then there's, in addition, there's a five-form flux, uh, which, when integrated over the phi sphere, tells you how many, a five-form five field, which integrated over the phi sphere, tells you how many units of flux there are. And so what coefficient there is depends on your normalization conventions. I didn't commit myself to that here. So the, so the formulas for these brains always consist of two terms, which I write as S1 plus S2. And the uh, term S1 is what's sometimes referred to as a dirac born infield uh, action, because it has features of both. But there are many other names you could associate with it, too. So I prefer to just call it S1. And the, the term S2 is sometimes called a Chern-Simons term. But again, there are many other term, names you could associate with it. So I call it S2. Uh, and so it's a functional of the embedding functions. So sigma are the coordinates of the brain world volume. And so, so th these tell you how the brain world volume is embedded in the 10 dimensional space time. So sigma is a, f so there are four, so alpha takes four values and m takes 10 values. And so that's the embedding of the D3 brain into the 10 dimensional space time. And in addition, the, uh, br the brain actions have a U1 gauge field, uh, which, is, which is just defined as a function on the world volume. And it ha has a standard U1 type field strength. And so the, uh, the term S1, when I neglect fermions, is just given by the pullback of the space-time metric to the world volume uh, plus, plus this U1 gauge field with a coefficient. And, and then you take the, the, so this is a four by four matrix. You take the square root of its determinant, and that's of the Born-Infeld structure. Uh, the kind of formula Born-Infeld wrote down would be, this would be this usual Born-Infeld if this were just a flat Minkowski metric. But so, so here we're interested in something a little more general than that, because this G is supposed to be the pullback of the space-time metric. So here's the 10 dimensional space-time metric given on the previous transparency, pulled back to the world volume in this manner. And the, the, the parameter called alpha prime, sometimes called the Rajay slope or slope parameter, is just the square of the string scale, uh, L sub s. And the D3 brain tension uh, is a standard formula, which I guess must have been written down first by Polchinski, uh, is given by this. Now, now, the formula is conformally invariant because it's got the symmetry of ADS. So only, do, so in the formulas I've shown you have, have this scale, the string scale has, is a length, and, but only dimensionless combinations appear in the brain, brain action. So one expression that appears in the brain action is this, which is this. And so just combining formulas I've already shown, you can deduce these things by simple algebra. And so these are the dimensionless combinations that appear in the formula. And general coordinate invariance allows you to choose a particular gauge. And so what you can do as a JH choice 
is to identify the coordinate. So we have four-dimensional general coordinate variants, so that's four local symmetries. And you can use them to identify the coordinates of the world volume with four of the space-time coordinates. And we're going to make a specific choice of that type. So, so out of the 10 x's, we pick four of them and identify them with a sigma. And then the other six are going to correspond to the scalar fields. And then eight. So, so after you've done that, the other six, which are originally functions of sigma, can now be interpreted as functions of the other four x's. So in that, and so in that way, uh, and, and again, a mu, again, which started out as the function of sigma, can then be deter considered to be a function of x. So in that way, you get what looks like an ordinary field theory. But before you do that, you have a formula with general coordinate invariance. So, that, so doing that, get the previous formula becomes this for the Dirac born infill or the S1 term in the action. And there are actually co all these things have coefficients here and here and here, which I've omitted, but I'll give later when, I, when I've. Uh, it wouldn't have fit on one line otherwise. So, so I left off the coefficients in this formula. Now, the entire action, including S2, turns out to be given by n times an expression that only depends on this it hoofed combination, lambda, so g string times n. And what that means is that if you were to take this action, so as a, the full world volume action, S1 plus S2, uh, and if you were to consider it at fixed lambda, the treating it, it its quantum expansion uh, would be an expansion in 1 over n. And, and so the treated so that means that the class, so and the 1 over n expansion in gauge theory at fixed lambda is the famous Etuft expansion. So, th so that suggests that the classical approximation, which, which is given by the formulas I've written down, uh, sh should correspond to the planar approximation of the, of the uh, field theory. So, so we're going to identify the formula as the candidate for the highly effective action. And the classical formula will then be viewed as capturing the full planar approximation of the field theory. If this is right, it's, that's a pretty powerful result. But it, of course, it could be wrong. So, for, and, for, and, and if it is the full planar approximation, that means it should have dual conformal symmetry as well as conformal symmetry, because that's one of the amazing things. And, 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 and the conformal symmetry plus the dual conformal symmetry generates the full Yangian symmetry. Yangian algebra. Yangian algebra. I mean, first generators of Yangian are generated Lie algebra, then you add more, more, more generators. Right? Like well, people consider Yangian of SU2, but you can consider Yangian of any Lie algebra. So, so this is a U1 theory. Um, I mean, it only has U, the abelian fields. So I, I get perhaps a little unsure how to answer you correctly. Yeah. We can talk about it more later. Uh, so, the, so this hasn't been proved, uh, but uh, it's an important test of the ideas. So, so the global symmetries, as I said, are the super conformal group, the PSU 2 comma 2 slash 4 when the fermions are included, or the, but we only have the bosonic subalgebra, which is this when we omit the fermions. And these are quite simple to describe before gauge fixing. But what happens when we go to the static gauge, uh, the, uh, typically uh, the uh, if you look at one of these transformations, it'll transform the coordinates a certain way. But we've fixed the x mu's to be equal to the sigmas as a gauge choice. And so you have to add a compensating general coordinate transformation. So this is just for infinitesimal transformations so that it doesn't transform. And, and that will impact how the other coordinates transform. Because if, if this is how it transformed before gauge fixing, then that means we get an additional 
contribution to the transformation of all, all these scalar fields given by, by psi equal minus <laughs> delta x mu. And the, 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 the gauge field itself didn't transform at all under the superconformal group before the gauge fixing, but it does after the gauge fixing. And when fermions are included, there will also be local kappa symmetry, which also will need to be gauge fixed. And there will be additional uh, compensating local kappa transformations analogous to what I just showed you. And these will give rise to complicated supersymmetry transformations, which initially are very simple. People who've tried to construct in some perturbative manner all uh, these type of corrections to the basic gauge theory find that they need to modify the supersymmetry transformations that they go to higher and higher orders. And that kind of algebra gets exceedingly complicated. So if the story I'm presenting is right, this gives sort of a systematic way of understanding those corrections. Okay. Of course, there isn't a very good superspace for n equal four. So, so the extra contributions can be interpreted as quantum corrections due to massive fields that have been integrated out. So this gives an intuitive explanation of these complicated terms found by this so-called Noether method. So that there is a second term, S2, which in the case of the D3 brain is as a contribution from the, the integral of the four-form Ramon-Ramon field. And, and then there's also a, a, a topological term where chi is a Ramon-Ramon zero form. And, and it actually chi is the expectation value. Otherwise, it'd be inside the integral. So, and, and this four-form potential has a five-form field strength, which is supposed to be self-dual. And the way to make it self-dual is very easy. It's proportional to the sum of the five, volume five form of the S5 plus the volume form of the ADS5, and that combination is self-dual. The constant chi, as I just said, is the value of the Ramon, Ramon zero form, C0. And it's proportional to what's usually thought of as the theta angle from the field theory point of view. Now, in the f formula for S1, let me, let me back up just to show you this. Uh, if we just take the eta piece here and, and ignore these, then this is 1. <laughs> and, and you see you have an integral of phi to the fourth. And we don't want a term like that. So that's what I'm referring up to here as a potential term. If you had such a term, that would mean that there was a force acting on the brain because uh, the, uh, it has a gradient. And phi, phi is going to correspond to the position of the brain in the, in the ADS space. And so this, this will put a, so that will force, see this forces phi to go towards zero. So this is forcing the brain to move in a certain direction. And so that term has to be canceled uh, because we know this is the BPS configuration where the forces on the brains should cancel. This remark is made in Maldacena's original paper. But what Maldacena doesn't explain is where the term that cancels this comes from. Uh, and and it turns out it's canceled by this term in S2. Uh, so, so the integral of C4 over the D3 brain world volume can be written as the integral of the field strength over a five-dimensional volume that has the D3 brain as its boundary. And uh, so, 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 I, I, so I've broken that five-dimensional integral up into a four-dimensional piece and a one-dimensional piece. And the, the volume of the form of the ADS5 has this structure. So, so doing the phi integral is very easy, and it just produces a phi to the fourth d4x. And uh, it turns out that I'm, I've, very, I've kept track of coefficients very carefully. And they, it works precisely right to, to get that required cancellation. So the complete answer 
uh, including S1 and S2, and the coefficients, but only dropping fermions, which we're not talking about, uh, then for, for this world volume action, is given by this formula, where lambda is the atuft parameter, n is the number of units of flux, phi is the, this phi squared is the square of the six vector phi i, and, and, the, uh, and if we go to static gauge, then g mu nu takes this form. So, the, so that's my action, which is supposed to be the bosonic part of a Coulomb branch theory, except that it has this parameter n in it, which we don't want for the Coulomb branch theory. The Coulomb branch theory doesn't have an n in it. And there's only one plausible guess as to what n should be. It should be 1, uh, because that would correspond to the SU2 case. Because this is the, so we have one, the idea, if, it, if n is 1, that means you have one you brain at infinity giving rise to the flux, and then we have our probe brain. So that's exactly the SU2 setup on the Coulomb branch. So we want to put n equal 1. So to, so, the, to get the, so to get the SU2 Coulomb branch effective action, we need to put n equal 1. And this is really striking because that's the case in which the probe approximation is worst. Right? n has to be very large for the probe approximation to be valid. But I don't care about that because I'm not really interested in the probe approximation. I'm interested in finding the Coulomb branch effective theory. And so, uh, so the, the thing that intrigues me about the formula is that it has all these symmetries. And, uh, and so, so I'm happy to put n equal to 1. Now, one, we'll, it'll be natural at some point to ask about higher rank gauge theories on the Coulomb branch. And I can say something about that later. So, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so we, we introduce a modular parameter, tau, uh, in the usual way. Uh, so the, the real part of tau is this parameter chi, and the imaginary part is given by the string coupling constant. So this is, this is the modular parameter for the SL2Z duality. And it's the standard formula. So, so let me now turn to the S-duality. So this S-duality has never been proved for the non-abelian gauge theory. There's lots of evidence. Everyone's convinced it's right, but it hasn't been proved. But for this highly effective action where we only have a U1 gauge field and not SU, it's not, where it looks abelian, we can actually do it by just explicit calculation. So, so I want to give you the flavor of how one proves S-duality, but I don't want to do it for the, tr for the full problem because that gets a little messy. So I'll give you an oversimplified analogous formula which, uh, where I can show the S-duality. So, so the assumption of what I'm doing, so th this formula doesn't have any scalar fields. So, th so this is the formula without the scalar fields, which also has S-duality. And, and, and the argument I'm about to give that this formula has S-duality generalizes to when you include the scalar fields. So, but even, even this example is non-trivial. So, so, uh, so if you kind of get rid of the scalar fields in a suitable way, uh, you, you have a formula like this. So, that's, so this, this is the, uh, the thing we had, the chi f wedge f. It can be re rewritten this way. And, uh, and this is then the Born-Infeld term. Here. And you can do the determinant, which is, gives you this. It's a 4 by 4 matrix. So, so to prove the S-duality, so I'm, I'm going to look for the S-transformation where tau goes to minus 1 over tau. So I want to demonstrate the symmetry under that transformation. So, so first of all, we introduce the Lagrange multiplier field that H, which, which is a two-form, which we, we, whose equation of motion will tell us that f is dA. So, so previously we put in that f was dA, but now I want to not put in that f is dA, just leave f as a free field, uh, I mean as an unconstrained field, and, and, and then force it to be dA, whoops, force it to be dA by adding this Lagrange multiplier term to the action, okay? But when, when you do that, you learn a few other things. Because uh, you can also now form the A equation of motion. So this will be the only A in the formula. So we're going to add this to 
everything else that we had. And so this is the only A in the problem, and its equation of motion tells you that H is closed, and so at least in suitable patches, you can write it as oh, dA prime. It's a, and so that'll define a dual gauge field. And now one can form the F equation of motion, because F is being treated now as an independent field. And so the F equation, so varying this F gives you this H dual here, and then varying F in the other formula gives you a complicated function of F and tau, uh, which is given by this formula. So what I need to do to prove the formula, to prove the S-duality, is I have to solve this equation. So, I, so, so R is H dual. So think H dual equals this. And then I have to solve this equation for F as a function of H dual. OK? So that is doable algebra, but it's not easy. It, I mean, it's challenging even for people of our stature. But it can be done. And uh, it's just algebra. And the amazing fact that you find after doing that algebra is that the solution is given by the same function. So f dual is now the same function in terms of h and tau prime, where tau prime is just minus 1 over tau, with a minus sign. So that, that, the, the, this kind of miracle about born infeld always amazes me. How did these guys in the 1920s or whatever it was write down this formula with all these fantastic properties? <laughs> so, so anyway, that's the... So, 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 so using this fact, it means that we can write a dual formula for the action in, in terms of the transformed parameter tau and the, and the, and the dual field h uh, in this way. And, and this expression will give exactly the same equations as the original action. And it has the same form uh, with uh, inter, just it's expressed in terms of the dual potential h. A prime, remember H. So the, this so this term tells you that this is a Lagrange multiplier term again, because I wanted to bring it to the same form we had before, where uh, this tells you that H is dA prime. So 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 if you get rid of this and just this is the uh, same expression in the dual way. So this is the S dual formula, because tau went to one over minus one over tau. So that's the way. Now, with the scalar fields added, the, form, the, the analysis is a little more complicated, but it works in a similar manner. So that's how one proves the S-duality. So let me now turn to ABJM theory. Uh, so, uh, so, there, there, so there are two different stories. Answer for the previous case. Mm -hmm. You showed a story model, but the final answer mm -hmm. well, the, it's, included is that complicated? Well, I did show it, but without fermions, but otherwise it w I did show it. Well, let me go back and point it out. <laughs> this, is the f this was it, right here. Yeah, yeah. So when you set the fermions equal to zero, <coughs> this, is, this is the final answer. So it's longer. Yes. Well, okay. So what do we? So what's weird about it is we have these. As I mentioned before, we have these phi's in denominators. Still local. Okay. See, that's still local. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there are no boxes in, the no. Nom in denominators. Fair enough. So you say there should be boxes. Well, that was the comment before. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or a question. You can look at the equa like equations of motion from this guy and see if you can construct these monopoles with just the F and Y fields. Exactly. So, and if you can do that, then your, then your comment earlier about these solitons being contained in this description is correct. Yeah. So, so I'm going to talk more about the solitons later, but although I haven't. There are no solitons. Although that's work in progress. There are no just solitons here. I haven't. I haven't said much about solitons, right. so, uh, but I'll, I'll comment on it later. So okay, uh, let me say it now, since the question's arisen. So the conjecture is that, the, that, the, that, when, that I'm going to put n equal 1, and then the claim will be that I can recover the w plus and w minus from this formula as solitons. I haven't proved that yet. That's work in progress. If I do that, the fact that this has SL2Z duality means I'll get the entire multiplet. So that I'll, get, I'll recover the monopoles that you know from the non-abelian theory will, will also be. So this full SL2Z multiplet 
of solid times would be there if I'm correct. So I'm trying to do the w plus minus case now. I haven't completed it. I'm so that, as I said, that's work in progress. And uh, so far, I haven't found any indication that there's a problem, but I haven't done it either. So, so it's still open as to whether it's going to work. <laughs> yes. Well, how do you get magnetic charge out of uh, the SU2 theory on the Coulomb branch? It's a It's the same thing. So, so the solitons can carry new kinds of charges. And uh, just like they do in the standard theory on the Coulomb branch, where you get magnetic charge. So here, one will get the electric charge and the magnetic charge and the whole business that arises. Yeah, one more quick question. Regarding self-duality, uh, S-duality, mm -hmm. Remember that Born Infeld in flat spaces has the S duality. Is yes. it true in a general curved background? That no, it's not. I, I, have, I don't think it's true in a general curved background. But this formula in the ADS, oh. I've shown you the analysis, or sketched the analysis. I haven't really shown it to you with the scalar fields. But yes, it's special. So I think it's special, but I haven't proved that it fails for other geometries. So, so I, that's why I hesitate to say it with certainty. But uh, let, let's just say I know it works in these two cases. It was completely stop, stupid to say that there was a self dual form. If you try to write a covariant expert self dual form, you usually get one of the scalar fields. Is that maybe a, one interpretation of these uh, inverse scalar fields? These, these tonine and. You say you, you can make the. You know, like tonine and all these people, they wrote actions down as one of the scalar fields in order to incorporate self dual fields. You're talking about this PST stuff? No. no. It's very old. And people try to write covariant yeah, actions. You're just talking about the pipe. Yeah. And this is back in the ADS. Yeah, you are talking about PST. Uh, I think that's something different. Yeah. I don't think, that, I don't think that's relevant. For pure electromagnetism without having. Yeah, I don't think that's relevant here. And uh, you think that. Um, Maybe with all the different symmetries, this is restricted, but I, one can show that self-duality is not as, nearly as restrictive as one might expect. And that, in fact, you can have higher order corrections to okay. self-duality. Okay. So, so the, my, my speculation is that the combination of this large superconformal symmetry plus the SL2Z duality is sufficiently constraining. Uh, that's, the, that's the basis of my conjecture. And I can make this identification of, of the formula with the full imagination. And, 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 I, and I'm willing to concede that I could be wrong about that. The superconformal symmetry. Um, I guess, am I wrong? I, th I think <coughs> because you spontaneously broken, broken it. Um, to be possible to understand all the fermions as Goldstone bosons in this context. Goldstone fermions, um, I know in a toy model it does work that Well, way. in flat space, when you do an analogous thing, which I did uh, almost 20 years ago, okay. uh, which is what I was. So we to do this uh, The. Uh, in that case, the fermions do have that type of interpretation. Right. I don't think they do in this example. They're, 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 they're playing a different role. Because here, uh, well, we, let's talk about that later. Okay. So let's go back to where okay, we were here. So, so in ABJM theory, I'm going to do a similar analysis. I'll be very quick about it because it's getting late. Uh, so I'm going to consider an M2 brain in ADS4 times S7 mod ZK. This is example considered in ABJM. And, and so this, we're going to find that we're going to have a probe brain action, which uh, will have a churn simons terms just for U1 fields at level K and, and minus K. So let me show you that. And we're going to relate that to what we get from a D2 brain of the type 2A theory in ADS4 times CP3. 
uh, for those of you who haven't studied this thing, I should mention that the, that the seven sphere that you will have in M theory can be viewed as a circle fibered over a CP3. And, and this modding out by ZK uh, just acts on that circle. So the claim is that a duality transformation, like the one described for the D3 brain, proves the equivalence of, the, of these two formulas. And all the calculations are carried out for n units of flux. But as before, I conjecture that the n equal 1 is the relevant choice for the u2 times u2 theory. So just to be sketchy or quick about it, uh, we, if the S7 can be described in, in terms of four comp So we think of the S7 embe as embedded in eight dimensions and describe the eight dimensions as four complex fields phi. And then one can write down, uh, one can describe that by an expression like this, uh, where one has introduced a gauge field B in here. And, uh, and the, symmetry is, the symmetry is such that it, it mods out the, uh, the right thing to leave you with a seven sphere. So the plan is to add a chern simons term to ensure that B is exact. And, then, and, to, and the modding out by ZK will be implemented by enforcing that, Z, that sigma has period 2 pi over K. And, th and then that will imply the equivalence that phi is equivalent to this. And, th and, th and that's what leads you then to mod out by the ZK from the seven sphere. The radius is given by a formula of this type in this example. And the flux condition becomes this, an analogy with what we had before. And the analysis is similar. The S2 term involves an integral over a ramon ramon 3 form. There's no analog of the F wedge F term in this problem. So this is the entire S2. And, uh, and this all, again, the contribution of this term, again, produces this minus 1, just as it did before, with exactly the right coefficient to cancel off the potential as is, as is required. And the, so, this, so the formula, including coefficients, is this. So k is the level of the churn simon so, so this is, this is u1 times, this term here is u1k times u1 minus k because it's written in terms of two one forms, a and b. And if you, if you form the combinations a plus b and a minus b, you can see that uh, you know, one, of, one of them is at level k and the other is at level minus k. And anyway, th th this term here, the a is acting as Lagrange multiplier, implying that b is a flat connection. And, and, the, and, the, and the k then uh, gives the zk quotienting. And again, this formula, as before, is n times the function of the atuf parameter lambda. So the same conjecture is about uh, uh, this b capturing the planar approximation and, and having uh, Yangian symmetry and so on and so forth, again, would apply. In the case of the D2 brain, we, we start with a formula like this. This is the ADS. Here's the CP3. And we can bring that to this form uh, by, uh, by writing a th where, we have a, where we have a seven sphere described this way. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What I want to do is to um, make contact with our previous formula. And uh, so this ds7 squared here has this uh, local symmetry. So even though this looks like it's eight dimensional, it's actually seven dimensional. Well, I, I'm, I, I can't, I'm going too quickly to explain these things carefully right now, for which I apologize. So, so well, why don't I, I, since it's late, let me just jump ahead. So putting these together, we get a formula like this for the D2 brain case, where W is, again, a Lagrange multiplier. And, uh, and by the same kind of argument as I did for proving the S-duality of the D3 brain, I can relate this D2 brain formula to the M2 brain formula as being dual descriptions 
of the same theory. However, this matching it involves a new ingredient because the D2 brain formula has parameters which are n and g sub string, whereas the uh, uh, as whereas the M2 brain had the n and the level k. So, so this means in, in relating the uh, D2 brain to the M2 brain, one needs to express G string in terms of the level K and the integer N. And it turns out that this is the relationship between them. This is a formula that already appears in the ABJM paper. And, uh, and I derived it independently, and we agree on all the numbers. Uh, so these are, all these numbers are really true. And the, the interesting thing about this is that even the D2 brain and the M2 brain description are equivalent. The M2 brain has a tiny bit additional information be beyond the D2 brain because it says that GS is not an arbitrary continuous number, but rather it has to be expressed in terms of two integers, N and K, in this manner. Which is curious. I've done an analogous analysis for an M5 brain and I get a formula, but the formula is, which is given here without the coefficients, uh, but the formula is hard to take very seriously because there's, this is the classical approximation to some quantum theory, but there's no parameter. So all the terms, all the quantum corrections to this should be just as important as this thing. So I'm not, so, so even though it's a nice formula, I'm not sure that it's good for anything. In the other cases, there are always the small parameters so that the classical formula makes sense, in, at least in some limit. <laughs> but, but the reason I show the M5 brain because, is because one of my motivations for this work was to understand the 2-0 theory. Uh, the, these are the mysterious six-dimensional theories for which there's no known action in six dimensions. And now, with the formula I just showed you, uh, we're, I'm claiming that at least on the Coulomb branch, I can write down an action, but, but I don't know how seriously to take it because of the fact that it doesn't have a small parameter. Uh, in that sense, it's a little bit analogous to the ABJM action uh, if you were, wanted to understand ADS4 times S7, because that would put k equal to 1, and then there would be no small parameter in, in that field theory either. So, so the formula is on sort of a similar status. Except that we don't, we can't ex generalize it with a parameter k as we did in the ABGM case. So that, so so therefore, the formula is possibly of some interest. What would happen if you tried to take more of the Well, I have explored, wasted many months of my life looking at ways of orbifolding ADS4 times S7 in uh, an attempt to replicate, I mean ADS7 times S4 in a way trying to replicate what ABJM did for the other problem. And I, I didn't find anything that made it look sensible to me. One scheme I had that I was pleased was, was involved orbifolding ADS7 because I viewed that as sort of some continuation of the S7. That was the idea, and so I could, again, preserve three quarters of the supersymmetry. Mm. But it turned out that that orbifolding of the ADS7 gave rise to closed time-like curves. I didn't want that, so. So my, my standards are such that I will not publish a paper with closed time. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to keep putting signature, you could <coughs> publish a hyperbolic seven. Okay. Yeah, that's what but then you can't do the overfolding on the S4? Well, the overfolding on the S4, I mean, you, it breaks a lot of supersymmetry. It's more supersymmetry. And I, I don't trust these kind of formulas unless they have lots of supersymmetry. So, so there are problems for the future. The one that I'm doing now, working on now, is exploring soliton solutions of these classical problems for the D3 brain case. So I'd like to show that the W plus and minus arises solitons. As I said earlier, I haven't achieved that yet. That's what I'm currently working on. Another thing I've thought about for a while but haven't completed either is incorporating the fermions. 
I know how to do this. I've done analogous things in flat space. It's just technically harder in this curved space. I'm sure I can do it, but it, it takes time, which I haven't had lately. Uh, if, if, if these statements about uh, dual conformal symmetry and Yangian symmetry are right, then they're, 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 it, it might be very interesting to explore tree approximation scattering amplitudes for, the, for these uh, uh, effective actions. Uh, so they should have some very nice properties. Performance symmetry, it's a hidden symmetry, yeah? Yeah, so, you, you so, 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 so I have an action. Yeah. And so the conjecture is that this action has the symmetry. Uh, we haven't proved it. I, I, there was a time I thought I had a proof, but it turned out that there was an error in it. Even <laughs> the paper I submitted and withdrew. Uh, but, uh, but I, I still think it's a good conjecture, but the, what, what I had tried the first time was wrong. So, so did you uh, explore it through the, you're saying you do this through scattering amplitudes? Well, I think that would be one way of finding at least evidence mm -hmm. for it. Yeah. OK, so let me just comment on this, that it might be interesting to compare expansions of our actions with, re, that, with results for Coulomb branch low energy effective actions that other people have done by ver various methods. Some people have done some approximate treatment of the path integrals. Others use this new method for just uh, blasting away <laughs> on the formulas. And, uh, and, and so to some level in, of approximation, uh, formulas for these Coulomb branch actions are known. I haven't tried to carry out careful ca comparisons because I, w I expect to find discrepancies, but these discrepancies might not be meaningful because there are issues involving field redefinitions and integrations by parts and all sorts of things like that, which could conceal the fact that the formulas agree. But, and, and then there's also the chance that somebody else might have made a mistake in these very complicated calculations. I would want to throw my results away because of that. So I've been a little scared about doing such comparisons. Uh, Saitlin informs me that he thinks that at two loops, there's an f to the sixth term that'll disagree. <laughs> yeah. He's a smart guy, and maybe he's right. But anyway, that's where it stands. So uh, other things uh, which are related to whether you, how seriously you take this proposal is to understand the extent to which symmetry and the symmetries and dualities should determine the formula. This is just, and if, if it's true, then you'd like to understand why a world volume theory of a brain probe should give, it a, should give the answer. There's clearly a relationship between the two, if you think about it, but it's not so obvious why it should give exactly the right answer. But one would want to understand why derivatives of field strengths don't need to appear. And we'd like to. And, and, and if all this should hold up, then, there, then one would like to generalize the higher rank gauge theories on the Coulomb branch, to theories of less supersymmetry, and so on and so forth. And the, these actions are supposed to include all the quantum effects of the massive degrees of freedom that have been integrated out, but then, these, but then this formula will have its own loop expansion to get the quantum effects of the massless fields, which you've kept. And, and so that, that's where you'll have to deal with infrared divergences and all those sorts of questions, which don't arise until you do that. And so, so, so there's much, so as, lo as long as this program isn't dead, there, there are many interesting problems to pursue. And that, that's what I want to do in the coming months. I hoped I would have achieved more since I submitted my paper uh, in early November, but uh, for various reasons, I just haven't had an opportunity to pursue this very much. So to conclude, we've conjectured that the world volume action of a probe P brain in a maximally or nearly maximally symmetric, supersymmetric space-time containing an anti-de-sitter P plus two with one unit of flux 
can be reinterpreted as a highly effective action for a superconformal field theory in P plus one dimensions on the Coulomb branch. And the main evidence is that the actions have all the required symmetries and dualities. And for the D3 brain, these include the, the superconformal group and the duality group. Uh, and the, the ver so the, the, and the two crucial tests, I think, are the construction of the solitons and the verification of the dual conformal symmetry. And, and those are problems that still need to be studied. So I'll stop there. On soliton solution, do you expect to find explicit analytical description of the corresponding solution, or are you doing, or you solving numerically classical theory? Yeah. So I have some highly nonlinear second order differential equation. All I got to do is solve it, right? And, and uh, I don't know, I've been staring at it for so the last couple of days. And that's and yeah, so, so I've been looking at it in various limits and expansions and so on and trying. Uh, but I, d I don't have the solution. Other questions? May I make a comment, a, a question to John and, and everybody else in the audience? <laughs> Which is about, suppose we have some sort of an effective action, normal effective action, with some mass so we can do an, uh, an expansion in derivatives. Um, let's take a simple case. Let's consider scalar. The point is that since the tree level Lagrangian has uh, five box phi term, if we do any term which has a box on a phi, you can eliminate the box by field redefinition. You can absorb it into the tree level Lagrangian by field redefinition. So, can one make that rigorous? Can one actually show that, in this sense, by some sort of suitable redefinition, you can make all the uh, make an arbitrary effective action just depend on first derivatives of fields and not second derivatives? I see. So you're raising the question that perhaps the fact that I don't there are no apparent non-localities in my formula might be consistent with the fact that there should be right. by, by doing suitable manipulations. So you, could, that, that, that you might be able to get from one to the other. Right. Yeah, well, that, that would be interesting to explore. And of course, then it might be interesting to ask whether this field redefinition has some physical meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we could discuss that some more. And even at the level of conservative fields, you have to be able to recognize things like interesting holes or non-trivial green functions. So I gave this talk earlier at a meeting where Polyakov was in the audience, and Polyakov raised the question, how would you see the W plus W minus threshold in your scattering out? It seemed like a reasonable question. So I, so I didn't have an answer at that spur of the moment for him. But the way I would answer it today is I would say if you took the usual Coulomb branch description where you keep the W plus minus fields, that theory has monopole solutions. And if you look at scattering in that theory, how do you understand the monopole anti-monopole thresholds? And you know that that, has, that is the full theory, so they've got to be there somehow. I don't know exactly the technicality of how you make, how you show that they're there, but whatever the answer to that question is, I would say that the same thing applies here. <laughs> you you get them because of the solid diagram? You, you you no, I just, suppose I'm just doing W plus W minus scattering in flat space in the usual Coulomb branch description of SU2. And I want to study a process in which you produce monopole, anti-monopole pair. So this is in, in a background without any mm -hmm. trivial background. Mm -hmm. uh, that there should be such an amplitude. But how do you understand it? In the usual description. Uh, that's obviously can't be perturbative. Obviously hard. It's not. It's a non-perturbative thing. 
And I think in this description, the W plus W minus pair production would be similarly non perturbative. Can you get any insight? I mean, there's an analogous case where we do know how to describe fermions as solitons of a pure boson Q, which is sine um, Does that give any insight? Or is it too simple? Because they have two um, Well, if you have more questions, I'll send you to the